What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews, exclusively here as always on the Casa D18 Studios channel. I, of course, am your host, the Renegade JJ Williams. And today's going to be a fun one because we're going to take a look at the other Universal Monster Classic to come out in the year 1931, and that is Frankenstein, the man who made a monster, starring Colin Clive. May Clark, John Bowles, Boris Karloff, Edward Van Sloan, and Dwight Fry. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for joining me here once again for another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews. And like I said during the introduction, we're going to take a look at the other masterpiece from the Universal Monsters that came out in the year 1931, Frankenstein. And... Out of the two, Frankenstein and Dracula, I feel like Frankenstein is by and far the most popular of the two. Nothing to take away from Dracula, but I just feel like the Frankenstein monster, the monster as represented by Karloff, just went on to supersede Lugosi's Dracula just a little bit as far as fame and popularity goes. I mean... I bought this shirt at Walmart, and you very clearly got Karloff's imagery of the monster on the face. It's very hard to go into a regular store and find Lugosi's Dracula on merch like this. You can go into specialty stores, and you may find shirts that were special made for those stores with Lugosi on it. But, I mean, to walk into a store like Walmart and find a shirt like this just goes to show the popularity of Karloff's monster. But I digress. Let's get into the story here, shall we? Because we've got quite a few pages of synopsis to cover through. Now, our movie opens with actor Edward Van Sloan stepping from behind the curtain and breaking the fourth wall in order to deliver some words of caution to the audience. Now, since we're not monetized, let's go ahead and take a look at this clip because I want you guys to see just how suspenseful Universal Studios felt this film was for its audience at the time. How do you do? Mr. Carl Emily feels it would be a little unkind to present this picture without just a word of friendly warning. We are about to unfold the story of Frankenstein, a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image without reckoning upon God. It is one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of creation, life and death. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Uh, well, we've warned you. Now, by today's standards, this film is tame. But you have to keep in mind the times. And we'll go into depth a little bit more with that later in the show. Now, after this prologue, we cut to a village in the Bavarian Alps where Henry Frankenstein and his assistant, Fritz, who is a hunchback, piece together a human body. Now, some of the parts are from freshly buried bodies, and some are from the bodies of recently hanged criminals. And in a laboratory he's built inside of a watchtower, Henry desires to create a human, giving this body that he's pieced together life through electrical devices but he still needs a brain for his creation. At a nearby school, Henry's former teacher, Dr. Waldman, shows his class the brain of an average human being and compares it to the brain of a corrupted criminal for comparison. Henry sends Fritz to steal the healthy brain from Waldman's class, but Fritz accidentally drops it and damages it, so he ends up bringing Henry the corrupted, 
criminal brain. Henry's fiance, Elizabeth, speaks with their friend, Victor, about the scientist's peculiar actions as of late and his seclusion. Elizabeth and Victor then go and ask Dr. Waldman for his advice and his help in understanding Henry's behavior. And Waldman reveals that he is aware that Henry wishes to create life. Concerned for Henry, they arrive at the lab just as he makes the final preparations on the lifeless body laying on the operating table. As the storm rages, Henry invites Elizabeth and the others to come in and watch, take shelter. Henry and Fritz raise the operating table toward an opening at the top of the tower. The creature and Henry's equipment are exposed to the lightning storm and empowered bringing the creature to life. Frankenstein's monster, despite its grotesque form, seems to be an innocent, childlike creation. Henry welcomes it into his laboratory and asks it to sit, which it does, understanding. He opens up the roof, which causes the monster to reach out towards the sunlight. And then Fritz enters with a flaming torch, which frightens the monster. And its fright is mistaken by Henry and Waldman for an attempt to attack them. And so the monster is changed in the dungeon where Fritz continues to antagonize it with the torch. Hearing Fritz shriek in the dungeon, Henry and Waldman run down and find that the monster has strangled and hung Fritz. The monster then lunges at the two, but they lock the monster inside. Realizing now that the monster must be destroyed, Henry prepares an injection of a powerful drug, and the two conspire to release the monster and then inject it as it attacks. When the door is unlocked and the monster lunges at Henry, Waldman injects the drug into the monster's back. As a result, the monster falls to the floor unconscious. Henry then collapses from exhaustion and Elizabeth and Henry's father take Henry back home. But Henry is worried about the monster, but Waldman reassures him that he will destroy it. While Henry is at home recovering and preparing for his wedding, Waldman examines the monster. And as he prepares to dissect it, the monster strangles him. The monster escapes from the tower and wanders through the landscape where he encounters a farmer's young daughter named Maria. Maria asks him to play a game with her, which they throw flowers into a lake. The monster enjoys the game, but when they run out of flowers, he scoops up Maria and throws her into the lake, where she disappears beneath the surface, causing the monster to run away. With preparations for the wedding completed, Henry is happy with Elizabeth. They are to marry as soon as Dr. Waldman arrives, but Victor rushes in saying that Waldman has been found strangled. Henry suspects the monster, and the monster ends up entering Elizabeth's room, causing her to scream. When the searchers arrive, they find Elizabeth unconscious, and the monster has escaped. Maria's father arrives, carrying his drowned daughter's body, and he says that she was murdered. So the villagers form a search party in order to capture the monster. During the search, Henry is attacked by the monster, as the monster knocks Henry unconscious and then carries him to an old mill. The peasants hear his cries and find the monster has climbed to the top, dragging Henry with him. The monster then hurls Henry to the ground, and his fall is broken by the veins of the windmill, saving his life. Some of the villagers bring him home, while the rest of the mob set the windmill ablaze, with the monster trapped inside. 
and our movie ends at Castle Frankenstein, where Henry's father celebrates the wedding of his recovered son with a toast to a possible future grandchild. We interrupt this episode of Renegades Reviews for an important announcement about... Merchandising! Merchandising? What's that? Merchandising! Come, I'll show you! Merchandising! Merchandising! Where the real money's made! Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network for all the t-shirts you see here from the West Coast professor Jeff Meacham himself. You can get shirts for the Jeff Meacham Network, Talk Wrestling, as well as the red and gold Meachamania shirts. And while you're there, don't forget to get your shirts of the Casa D18 Studios Brotherhood, the Dads on Wrestling shirt, the Renegade J.J. Williams, Stat Boy Sports Bar, and the hashtag Statboy Approved shirt. Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network and score your shirts today. I'm not going to waste any time here lollygagging, BSing. We're going to bring in a very special guest. You know him as the owner, operator, CEO of the Jeff Meacham Network. The man, the myth, the legend himself, Jeff Meacham. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me here once again on Renegades Reviews. Yes. Now, let's go ahead and get the the small talk out of the way here. What is it about Frankenstein and the Frankenstein monster that compelled you to come onto this show above all the others that I'm covering this month? Well, I, I think we talked about it as we headed into October that, you know, Frankenstein holds uh, a particular closeness to you and I as far as our uh, friendship and our time as uh, roommates and family and whatnot, because you actually had the opportunity to show this particular movie to my, at the time, three-year-old son, uh, when back when Dylan and I were still living with you, and surprisingly to my well to my surprise anyway you know I, I mean i had never sat there and watched it the whole way through before so i was like we're gonna show a three-year-old horror movie okay sure but i i neglected to remember that you know 1931 horror is much different than at the time 2011 horror which was you know 80 years after the fact which is right, which is which is why i had decided to start with frankenstein because dylan at three years old very much wanted to be like me and Uncle Bruce, you know, sitting there watching these Freddy, Jason, Michael movies. And it's like, whoa, 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 little homie, you three years old. Pump them bricks, dog. <laughs> these movies are going to F you up. Yes. You want to watch horror movies? We're going to do it like this. We're going to take you. We're going to go back, way back, back into time. And we're going to show you these classics. And if you can handle this in time with your proper Jedi training, Jeez. then you can build your tolerance up to Freddy, Jason, Michael, Chucky. But if this man right here, the gentle giant, as he is often referred to in these universal documentaries, if this man freaks the hell out of you, nah, homie. Yeah. I, I I also think that, and, and this is just, you know, looking back with the gift of hindsight 10 years after the fact, I think Dylan having been around the wrestling business so early and seeing these giants who would go out there and beat the dog out of each other and then come back to the locker room and do anything, but was definitely helpful to him in that, in that respect, which is why I think he did so well, even early on meeting Tyler main later on, because as we know, Tyler main is no small gentleman. No, even now. <laughs> so um, the fact that, you know, at the time he wasn't quite the 2009 Michael Myers with more hair than your average uh, uh, 1970s porn. Um, and I'm talking just stuff you can't see on camera most of the time, but um, uh, the fact that he actually had, you know, a shorter facial hair and everything, but still he was very much 
Tyler, um, helped a lot. So I, I think he benefited from that. You know, I also think that, you know, it really depends on the subject material. Like you said, these, for lack of a better term, pre-code movies that, you know, the, the, the business was so, oh, you know, you, know, you can't, you, you have to put a crack it on these. How violent did they get? Not too long after that. And you're going, there's codes on these now compared to then. Oh, right. Sure. That makes no damn sense. Um, so we'll go with that since you guys are the boss and we're just universal and know what the hell we're doing. Um, you know, being a movie movie studio since before most of y'all people in these suits were born, but sure. Um, I just, I, I, I found myself surprisingly okay with it. Subsequently when it came along and I wasn't there and I found out, I was like, okay, that's a little much, but you know, that was his mother's choice because she wanted to battle her own fear of the clown that was previously her uh her dr frankenfurter and good for her so i mean at the end of the day when you really go back and you look at this yeah there's a few really violent scenes in the film right but for a three-year-old yeah. who's like you said been exposed to the wrestling business that's not going to phase him no the, the stuff that I thought that would phase him the most, and I made sure that we discussed this with him before we put the movie on, right. was the scene with little Maria. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and trying to make sure he understands that even though the monster is this seven-foot-tall, you know, man-creature, He's very much a child. Yes. Because yeah. he has only lived in this body for a few days. Right. So getting a three year old to understand that this big, scary creature isn't very different from him. Right. And I feel was the key because. Now you've put it onto a level that he understands. Like, okay, he may be doing bad things, but he doesn't know any better. Right. I do bad things sometimes. I'm three, but I don't really know any better. I haven't learned better yet. No. And I think even now watching it, you know, you're able to introduce the element that, hey, the brain that was introduced to this body was one of a criminal nature. So while... You know, at the time, you know, the thing with Marie, it was still very, it seemed innocent. It was basically, you know, the, a message from the, the movie maker saying, hey, the criminal brain is less than, is not as good as us normal people, which is why he does the things he does. Total message from the from the people behind the movie saying, hey, criminals are bad people. You know, that, 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 that was completely the message. I'll, I said it when I first saw these movies. I'll say it again. I'll say it till the day I die. But at the same time, you were able to sympathize with the creature's plight in life because, like you said, he don't know no better. Exactly. Now, I, I, I said this to you off air about me coming on for this show. Mm -hmm. I'll say it here to you now in front of everybody. The scene that really gets me now, looking back 10 years after and having been a father for 10 more years, is the scene after the scene at the at the waterfront with the father carrying little Marie's lifeless body through the town and the and the town's reaction doesn't bother me so much it's the father he is lights on nobody's home man he is just stone cold like walking through i don't mean stone cold bmf walk walking down there and stunning everybody in town that is not what i mean children Although um, that would have been hilarious. That would have been funnier in hell, especially in 1931, because Rage Against the Machine had been going, we stole our shit, like, years ago. What the hell? Um, but anyway, um, and Jim Johnson's going, I can't even sue for that. I wasn't even born. Bastards. Um, anyway. I uh, went way off in the weeds. That's okay. Uh, but just the reaction. Just I mean, he's, like I said, he, he's he got the, he's literally carrying his child's lifeless body. There can be no greater horror for a parent than burying your own child. I've heard it said time and time again, unfortunately, in my life, having had friends and people I know, you know, with the whole, you know, 
uh, advent of underage drinking and whatnot that we've had in our lifetime. Unfortunately, it's been a very prevalent thing with our generation, um, you know, parents burying their kids. It ain't fun. And in 1931, I'm sure it wasn't fun. I'm sure when the story was set in the 1800s, it damn sure wasn't fun. So, you know, to have to deal with that kind of grief and, my God, for poor Henry to, you know, have this literal delusion of grandeur and then retrospectively go, my bad. It's like, dude, where was your bad two days ago, you idiot? Like, seriously, like, you had everybody in your other telling you this might not be a good idea, you know, but you want to play God. Okay, cool, dude. You know, and, you know, you played God and by proxy, your creature played God unintentionally. And now, you know, the talents play God right back with you. Yeah, I mean, Henry, you can almost slightly forgive because we've all been in that place where we get an idea in our head and no matter who tries to stop us, we are so tunnel vision focused that until we accomplish that mission, I don't want to hear it. Don't talk to me. Get out of my face. Go away. And that's very much the mental state that Henry was in. Like he took Dr. Waldman's class and he felt that he could go beyond what he was being taught. And until he proved such, go away, get out of my face. He was pushing his fiance away. I mean, can we just, all kidding aside here for a second, can we imagine how much less stressed Henry would have been if he had at least had Elizabeth with him to, you know, to get a little stress out of his system every couple of nights? You know, just throwing that out there. As you were going along talking about, you know, once you tell me, like, how many people, including yourself, have told me the last two years, dude, you got to get out of this tunnel, man. You got to, you know, you're, and I'm, and I'm, no, I, I'm building the empire. I'm building my creation. Leave me alone. I'll sleep when I need it. And it's, you know, I mean, you know, again, not to, not to, you know, be graphic or whatever. But yeah. Getting some type of, it would have been good every once in a while. I'm not going to lie. So uh, yeah, I, I totally get where you're coming from there. Yeah. You know, to, to be locked in a tower for who knows how long he was in there setting these machines up. Yeah. Building this body with nothing other than Fritz. Yeah. Who's not exactly sane in of himself. No. I mean, if we look at Dwight Fry as Renfeld in Dracula, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. We, we already know he's a few short of a, you know, happy meal. Yeah. He, he, he's having a few pints short of a blood bank there. So, yeah, just a, little, a little bit. But, um, the, the story, and let's just get into here really quickly. Mary Shelley was 19 years old when she wrote this. Yeah. Yeah. Virtually on a dare. Right? You know, because if the reports I've read are true, her, her husband, and their friend basically, like, had a challenge amongst each other to see who could come up with the best scary story. Yep. And Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Yeah. And for, you know, late 1800s, that's, yeah, she wins. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I bring up the story because I threw out there on Twitter the other day. And sadly, nobody replied to my tweet. We only got one reply to your tweet. So we'll go ahead and throw it up there. Yeah. You know, we asked about what people thought of the Frankenstein film. Yes. And the one guy that replied to us, JJ Arwood said, it's one of the best written stories and adaptation of said story ever made. Yep. You know, and then side note, Fra- Frankenstein's always been one of my favorite things to draw. Right. And he sent along quite a few drawings, which are actually, actually pretty, uh, pretty interesting to look at if you follow i follow jj on twitter the other jj on twitter because he uh he actually was one that steered me toward uh, kenny bowen uh, about a month and a half ago so we've been kind of conversing back and forth so um yeah i it's definitely one of the greatest pieces of uh uh literature ever produced um and 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 if you've read the actual book it's very much more of a 
it's very much more reality driven, much more grounded than the universal monster universe made really all of these characters. I mean, th I mean, e even for 1930s and 40s, they're very like, you know, big bombastic production. They weren't all that like, ha, 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 you know, yeah, remember 1800 literature, you know, they're, they're writing about either what they know or what is coming out of their minds. 1800s, you know, in Europe and in America, kind of a batch, well, not this batch of crazy now in the world, but, um, you know, very much a war driven place on both sides of the Atlantic. So they're writing about, you know, conflict and, you know, basic human drama, basic human error and flaws. And, you know, again, we go back to Henry, you know, that basic flaw of, you know, tunnel vision is a bitch. So, you know, the monster in the in, in the book, the, the original novel, is very much more, you know, human looking. He doesn't look like, you know, the guy that would become Fred Munster in the 1960s. You know, he just you know, he just he's just a guy kind of literally pieced together piecemeal. You know, I really. So I don't mind necessarily, you know, Universal's, you know, take or you know, whatever, or whoever originally originated the bolts in the neck thing, you know, and the whole Jack Pierce. Thank you. Appreciate that. That Thanks. was all Jack Pierce, you know. And gotta gotta give shout out to Jack Pierce for his work on all these monsters because without Jack Pierce, there would have been no Rick Baker. Right. There would have been none of these legendary makeup artists right. from today, you know. Forgive me for blanking on who came up with the Freddy makeup. Right. But you know, it all started with Jack Pierce. And Lon Chaney Sr. prior to that, because Lon Chaney did all his own makeup. Man of a Thousand Faces. There you go. Um, and, I, and I know you know that. So um, I'm sure, yeah, to talk about earlier in the week. So there you go. Or last week, so whatever it was. So, and, you know, not to, you know, you know, project later, but, you know, it's people like that that enabled people like the people we're going to see on Saturday. Chris Nelson, for example, the special effects artist for the new Halloween trilogy to be where he is today because you know very simple stuff to us looking back nearly a full century but back then like mind-blowing like how the hell did you turn boris karloff into that how did you turn lon cheney senior and junior into that how yeah. basic makeup kids that's why these movies work and i'm sure he's gonna say that every day until we get past the universal uh monster cutoff if you will especially about the cheneys because damn it you know okay spoiler alert for his coming up in a few days wolfman works so well because you can see lawn's facial features and their reactions oh Armageddon! what a revelation but yeah no shit um, you know, much like Boris Karloff here, he looks like he's scared of the fire because his freaking face is scared of the fire. <laughs> like, which I've always wondered about that because the monster never seems to be very scared of much of anything. Right. I'm wondering if the criminal whose brain they used died in a fire of some kind. Has to be something like that because that's the only thing that really really takes him down it, it's funny it, it, you know again the uh the 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 burden and the blessing of hindsight i'm seeing this or uh, doing this with you after having seen the second of this new venom set they're doing with tom hardy in the role of eddie brock slash venom and you know both venom and carnage both have a problem with light slash fire and sound you know if you notice the monster's not all keen with sound either very much so I definitely know that, you know, these, you know, these modern monsters, you know, I mean, you know, granted, Stan Lee wrote Venom and Carnage and all that uh, against Spidey back, you know, damn near 60 years ago now, but it still works. The best stuff in fiction and in life always translates well going forward. The monster doesn't care for certain sounds, because if you right. think about it in Bride, He's attracted to the violin by Very the blind hermit. Very true. Very true. You know, it's the violin that brings him to the hermit's house. And he then enters and the two become friends. Very true. Very Which true. We'll definitely get into that in a couple of days. But oh. um,
mentioned about the 30s and their time and everything. And I wanted to throw a little clip up here. Okay. Something I found on someone else's YouTube channel. Okay. Um, you may recall the video I sent you a couple days ago with the guy talking about the Universal Monsters. I do, yes. Yes. One of his other videos in the same series, granted, it's about Vincent Price. Mm -hmm. But he goes into this little diatribe, if you will, and he's talking about the fly. Mm. And I, I really want to throw this clip up here because I feel like it, it's relevant when we talk about these universal monsters. So this is a gentleman named Heath from YouTube, and his website is called Serial at Midnight. So the rest of these, let's just fly through them. Haha, <laughs> fly. The fly. Uh, epic movie. Fantastic movie. This is another one that when I was younger, I thought was kind of stupid, which is is wrong. <laughs> it's criminal of me to have thought that about a Vincent Price movie. Because um, I had come, obviously I saw the Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis movie first. Uh, and I was like, oh, that movie's gross and it's scary and it's visceral. And then you watch this one and there's like a fly that's like, help me. Help me me and uh you're like what am i watching how am i supposed to but of its time you gotta put these things in their context uh don't want to be movie dad or anything like that but i think it's important i will just say i think it's important that we try to watch movies on their terms not on ours not meaning like well uh the movie like, I have to change everything about myself. But you got to try to put a movie in context of when it was made, what it's trying to do. Uh, we have a tendency to want to drag things to us. Um, movies don't, they don't change. Like, movies stay fixed in a place in time. Like, this movie was made in 1950, 1958. And it is a 1958 movie. And it will always be a 1958 movie. And as our perspective, as we get further from 1958, as we move through our life, our perspective on this changes. Um, and so I think it's important to try to watch movies for what they are and not try to watch them for what they aren't. And that's something that I'm trying to constantly struggle with myself. That's why I revisit certain movies like uh, the, the recent, uh, I picked up the King Kong, Peter, the Peter Jackson King Kong movie because I've watched that movie before and I didn't really like it. In fact, I very much didn't like it. Um, but I have changed perspective since then and I need to revisit it to see if I still feel that way, if I'm in the same place, because I'm obviously, I'm not in the same place, and maybe I'll feel differently about it. The Fly is a movie that I did not like when I first saw it. I thought it was corny. I've since come to absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. This is another one of those that's uh, such a great Vincent Price role, and if you can get over the, you know, if you can make allowances for things like special effects, uh, there's, it's a really cool story. It's just a really great story. Dude, that guy hit point after point. I'm sitting here going, dude, this guy watches me. I feel like <laughs> I'm not saying I'm his stuff or whatever, but it's very like I I always talk about some movies stand the test of time and seem timeless. Back to the future. Um, some very much live in their own time. However, that dude is spot on. You know, if you're gonna watch horror movies in October. Or, you know, any time of year, you have to remember when they were made. Frankenstein 1931 doesn't translate to an audience in 2021 unless you understand that. You know, you're not going to see these giant CGI things with Frankenstein being greener than the Incredible Hulk. Because that wasn't available back in 1931. But, as you've said to me, time after time, and, and like I said, I totally blew away your whole... Uh, your whole facial theory here. So sorry about that in advance for when you eat the Wolfman later in the month. But, you know, that was the beauty of these things. You know, they didn't have to, you know, splice on. And again, I'm going to, I'm probably going to tear your shit completely apart at this point now, but Benicio del Toro's version of the Wolfman. That's why it doesn't work for us, for, for us. Now I, I, I'm not saying that a modern audience won't get behind you know, a modern, you know, Wolfman or a modern Frankenstein's monster or whatever. But for us old school chittens, it's like, yeah, but. Like, I don't need to see the Wolfman have a long snout. And, you know, it's like, no, man, I need to see 
his pain. I need to see the monster's pain when he's confronted with fire. I need to feel the monster's pain in that face when the bride rejects him because he, he ugly looking or whatever the hell she's doing, you know. I need to feel that. 2000s movies, I don't feel that with these characters. Yeah, and I think that's what the biggest problem is with Universal trying to get this dark universe off the ground. Yep. You know, because at the end of the day, the Universal Monsters was the first shared universe. Mm -hmm. Yep. It didn't start that way. It didn't really start to turn that way until Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. And they saw what money they made there, and then they just ran with it. Then you got, you know, House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, Abbott and Costello meets. Right. But the Universal Monsters is very much the first shared universe. Like, you want to talk about a blueprint for the Viewisk universe, for the the Brat Pack universe, because a lot of those movies take place in the same town, so you can assume that these kids all know each other, even though they don't really interact with each other. Yep. You want to talk about a blueprint for the MCU and the DCEU. It all started here. Right. And I really wanted to play that clip because like you said the guy is spot on and i think that's why it took so long for me to be able to appreciate films like a christmas carol it's a wonderful life yankee doodle dandy and things of the sort because when you're a kid and your grandparents your parents are watching these movies you're sitting there you're like the hell man you know, we've joked about it a hundred times. Mickey Mouse and his homies did this movie in under 30 minutes. Why am I sitting here for two hours? Plus some time. <laughs> Get with the program. Jason. You know, It's a Wonderful Life is close to three hours. Right. You know, I've seen this story before. Why am I sitting here through three hours? Kermit but then, as you age, like, like he said, as you age... And your state of mind changes and you're not in the same place anymore as you were as a kid. You can revisit these things and appreciate them. And granted, the Universal Monsters have kind of always been in my blood. Right. Ever since I saw Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, which we'll get to later in the month. Right. But I can totally get trying to show these movies to a modern audience and them being like, it's black and white. It's an hour plus. It's not really a movie. It's a TV special. It's this is this is supposed to be scary. Yeah, I and I can totally get where they come from, but those are the people that grew up with Freddy, Jason, Michael, Chucky, Pinhead, Leprechaun, Ghostface. Samara from the ring, etc. The list goes on and on. Jigsaw. Right. They didn't have this prior to that. No. By complete comparison or stark contrast, if you will, you know, him mentioning the fly was very interesting because I actually did the same thing. I saw the Jeff Goldblum version first. Now, granted, I saw it many years after I'd seen Jeff Goldblum be pretty much every other damn character he's been. But, you know, even for, you know, late 2000s, pretty scary shit, you know, as opposed to Vincent Price's, which isn't scary to a modern audience. But again, I had already had my brain kind of evolve into, okay, this is scary because this is scary because, you know, it's, you know, so the 1950s, that's, that's pretty scary. Um, you know, for me, the first exposure to the universal version of Frankenstein's monster is Herman Munster from the Munsters. So to watch the Munsters, you know, religiously in reruns as a kid and then come across you and actually sit and watch the movie, it's like, this is not what I remember. Both, eh? You know, seeing Dracula as a scary, you know, dark-haired man as opposed to a lovable grandpa just being a goof, goof-ass in his lab, you know, it's like, huh, all right. You know, seeing the Bride of Frankenstein with her hair not like not quite Marge Simpson-like, you know, on the Munsters, and then going to the Bride, it's like, Huh? So it was, it, 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 you know, it takes the brain, you know, your brain has to 
I've learned through the course of watching your show, your brain has to deprogram itself from what you know. Very much like a wrestling fan, you know, a you know a wrestling fan that discovers the WWE in the Attitude Era, you know, has to go back and watch the Hulk Hogan stuff, going, "This is hokey, this is lame." Like, this, this doesn't work for me, brother. Um, so like seriously, I, I get it. Like, and I've got it more so in the last decade plus because of being able to have a perspective. There is no greater example of that than me mildly for the brief moment I did backing off of hating the ducks and the sharks and whatever, because we have to preach tolerance, Jeff. We have children to the, no, but I did because I had to, because I had to be a good responsible parent, but you know, I evolved from that since then. But um, the other stuff I've, I've, I've been really good about, you know, I, I was going to mention a, another uh, comparison and it, it's so funny, you know, because, you know, you talk about things that come up, we did a recap the other day. You held up Grease, Grease 2, and the, the live Grease that they did just, just a few years ago. You know, I told my mom that that exists. She goes, I'm not buying that. Grease 2 sucks. And I went, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> First of all, it's only $10. So we real, I really drop in any money we're going to need, like, like miss later. Number two, my Rocky Horror cast an entire Shadow Cast degrees to because it sucks so bad. That's how awesome it was for us to try to, you know, you know, uh, disassemble and put back together again. Does anybody really remember Grease the most for the Vanessa Hudgens thing on Fox? No. Okay. But it's a different perspective. Rocky Horror itself being owned by Fox and that made for TV thing that they tried to pass off as a good successor. And even Tim Curry with his old state was like, yeah, I'm here for the check. Thanks. Um, you know, t- type thing. It was just bad, but you know what? I know a lot of people in the Rocky Horror community that absolutely adore the Laverne Cox version of Rocky Horror. So for some people, modern audiences, this is their first exposure to it. Exactly. You know, they don't want to sit through John Travolta, Olivia Newton, John, they don't know those people no. the way we do. No. You know, realistically speaking, what has John Travolta done of any significance, I'll say since hairspray? I, I, I was gonna say, if, if you don't if you're not familiar with John Hair familiar with John Hairspray, it's familiar with John Travolta prior to that redonkulous costume he wears in hairspray, you're not gonna understand 1978 Travolta. You know, skinny, skinny jeans, and you know, and leather. You know, in either movie, either the Night or you know, Grease. You know, you know, if you've never really, you know, seen Stalker chanting outside of the White House, you're like, what am I watching? Yeah, but modern audiences know who Vanessa Hudgens is. Exactly, they've grown up on High School Musical. God help. They've it. seen her in some of her other films, be it Spring Breakers or Journey Two or other things. You know. You know. If you've only seen Julianne Huff as a dancer, you know, with, you know, a, a minor opinion as a judge dance with the stars, why is she Sandy? Why is this happening? You know, what, what, why is our Olivia Newton-John being parodied? It's like, no, 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 no. Hold down. It's not what it is. And yes, with all respect to my mom, she's right. Grease 2 is just god awful. Okay. It, it, it's a terrible movie. But, you know, a lot of people like Michelle Pfeiffer's, you know, breakout role. They like DD Khan being back. They like the way they tried to go, fail miserably. Yes, but they tried it. They tried to make it an anthology. You know, I'll tell you what. You want to talk about somebody trying to make an anthology series just to see if they could do it and realize, okay, we screwed up. We'll fix Halloween three. You take off the Halloween part of this thing. Season of the Witch is a damn good, scary ass movie. But because it's not Michael, it's an abortion. No, it's not. We're, we're getting off topic a little bit, but I will just say this about this. And the whole reason why I went ahead and bought it is because I already owned Grease. Well, of course. I needed to get Grease 2 for my musicals month. Right. And my choices were, I think it was like $7.99 just to buy Grease 2. Yeah. Or for two bucks more, I got all three on Blu-ray. On Blu-ray. So it's like, for the extra two bucks, may as well. Right. And, and see, that is the, uh, again, you know, we, we use the word ble- blessing and burden of hindsight. You know, 
if you go back even 10 years and you see Grease 2 or you see, you know, the modern, like, you know, not to try to, you know, pull out. Of, how much did you pay for this for me out of curiosity for, for, for these six movies? I want to say it was roughly 30. Okay. So $30, you know, that's less, that's roughly $5 a movie. If you go back. Steel and book. Tell, what's that? Steelbook. Steel, yeah. I mean, I mean. With a big universal logo on the back, that, that, as Adam Pierce would say, it is official. Um, so you know, if you go back even ten years and tell somebody, "Hey, you can get the classic six for thirty bucks," they're gonna crap their pants because those six movies only thirty bucks. Really, the advent of streaming and convenience of not having to. It's so inconvenient to open a book and insert a disc now, and I can just push a button. Which, quite frankly, digital copies, beautiful add-on. Thank you for that. Um, because my ass is lazy, I admit it. But, you know, you and I are both the generation of, no, hard copy, pretty. Yeah. Hard copy, need. Like I said, dude, you guys talk about this on recap. Is there, I make my living on hard copies. Is there really a need for me in 2021 to have the entire Halloween series on hard disk? No. But there is for me. Because I, that's how I, that's how I do. That's how I roll. Exactly. We've gotten way off in the weeds. But but you try know, to but, try to wind it back just a little bit. You well, know. Well, I was gonna say not really though because you know we 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 went off from that clip of talking about you know perspective and modern audiences compared to the audiences right. of the nineteen thirties and you know nineteen thirty one there was no even VHS back then if you didn't catch it in the theater. You didn't see it until so. the advent of television when they started showing these on TV, which is another point that guy makes in his Universal Monsters collection video because you have to compare the way Creature the Black Lagoon doesn't really stand up next to Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman, right? But he came around in the television age. Yep. So he looks more like a television character and a television scary character as opposed to the monster, the bride. I'd, yeah, I'd be more I'd be more likely to, in my opinion, to see the creature on an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents or the Twilight Zone, along with those pig face guys. Like seriously, that, that that's where I see the creature fitting in better. So he makes again. Subscribe to that guy's video because I mean, and that channel because that guy gets it. He one hundred percent gets it. And prior to the movie coming out, this was his debut. Abbott and Costello meet the creature from the Black Lagoon, a television special for the Abbott and Costello show. There you go. Again, perspective, so, everything. Yeah, perspective is a beautiful thing. We've said it a couple times. It's a blessing and a curse. Yes. But if you guys take anything away from this episode or from any of these episodes all month long. Yes. Really go back, sit down, give these films a chance because by not at least attempting to watch these, you are seriously missing out on an era of film history. Yeah, I, I, I have said, you know, had I not gone headlong in the idea of, okay, we're doing a Halloween panel at the end of the month, a Universal Monsters panel would be a wonderful thing to do ac across the multiverse, if you will. Um, you know, because... It's always next year, Meech. Always, I was going to say, that was always next year. And I probably, looking back, I probably should do the Halloween panel next year when the series ends like it ever that's going to end but um you know blumhouse is already saying he's open to make more and i'm like no blumhouse that's a bad blumhouse yeah exactly yeah it's like dude, let it end it ends god damn it exactly let let yourself be chris uh chris nolan and just let it be man three's good follow the zemeckis nolan diagram brother like come on man three's good and you told a hell of a story a couple years ago i'm a few days off from seeing how you do with the middle act Counting on you boys. Anyway, um, um, but yeah, it's 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 yeah, much like you know, these movies, you know, looking back, god, 90 years, even the Halloween movies right. look back just over 40, completely 
different perspective. And each evolution or de-evolution, if you want to call it that, of the, of the timeline of Michael Myers attracts a different audience, good, bad, or indifferent. And that's how these movies rightfully so should be. You know, somebody watching Frankenstein for the first time at three years old, like the boy who meandered in here all sick as a dog just now, 10 years ago, um, is different from him seeing it for the first time, let's say right now. Yeah. Different perspective. Because, because as a 13 year old, he's been exposed to okay. more out there in the world in film. Like you said, you guys just came back from Venom 2 the other day. Right, exactly. So 13-year-old Dylan sitting down and watching this may very well have that this is corny perspective. You know, I've seen other more scary horror movies. It's, uh, again, it's very funny. I'm sitting in a theater as as scary as the scenes were and as intense as they were, I'm telling myself going, I'm going to sit through a modern Michael Myers movie in 10 days. I'm going to be in deep shit because they're very loud, very sensory. I'll never forget. I forget which movie it was now. I'm sorry if you're watching this, like you actually are watching this at home. Um, but Dylan's mom and I went and saw The Condemned back when it came out in 2007 with Steve Austin. That opening scene is so loud and so visceral Thank God it was a dollar movie theater. She booked it. She was done. Because it was so just up in our business, she couldn't sit through even the opening scene. Again, perspective is everything. If 2021 goes to see that movie with her, I'm probably in the same, the same car back across town coming here. Because even during the Venom scenes, I'm like, oh, this is loud. And I'm thinking... Yeah, Halloween's going to be really loud next week, too, because that's where the series has gone. If you make 1931 Frankenstein like the Frankenstein now, again, the audience is going to go, yeah, this is kind of lame and boring. But, you know, adding on sound effects, adding on loud music, add, uh, is, it takes away from the core of what made it work back in 31. And... Much like I said earlier, you know, what makes Back to the Future work, God, you know, darn near, you know, 40 years itself later is the simplicity of it all. You know, I, 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 sometimes will, less I is problem, more. Exactly. I have no problem sitting down with him and watching any of these. Honestly, you know, even, you know, the, the, the newer ones now with, with Michael, I have no problem sitting down with him with most of them. You know, again, three deviates from the course, and it's just a, pretty much a, a gross situation. But I wouldn't have a problem with that because it's a different audience. Because the audience for that movie at this point is now thirty, the uh, almost forty years older. So, you know, it really is perspective. And I love, like I said, that 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 that's definitely a theme all month for you because you're going through pretty much majority pre-code horror movies. And if you know what pre-code is. Go look it up. Educate your own damn self. You'll you, you'll thank both of us later for that. I promise you. Um, but yeah, these movies prior to the MPAA going okay, yeah, we can't have this. You know, be so what it is. It's like yeah, but once you guys cracked down on us, you made it even harder for us to take. You know, anybody to see these things. So, you know, I I, I don't know if these movies get an R rating looking back. I, I don't know what the ratings were back then. I don't know how they fell out. I don't know. But I, I would say most of them would at least be PG 13. I was going to say, I don't, you know, I don't think any of these on the six you gave me rated R at, at, at this stage of the game. Maybe, maybe the mummy because it's, you know, it's, it's a little more uh, visually intense and maybe visible man because it's a little more audio intense. It's, very, very intense. You have his little man. But the other four, I mean, I mean, Frankenstein, and again, we're talking about Frankenstein, so let's get back to that, kids. Um, um, yeah, there's a lot of loud, a lot of sensory overload with the fire and the screaming and everything, but I, and the violence level in 2021 is not high at all. I don't think it's an R. I think it rides that PG slash PG team line very much like a like a uh, like a like like a freaking bucking bronco. It, it's very very it holds on tight to being on either side of that line. I'd agree with that. 
We interrupt this episode of Renegades Reviews for an important announcement about... Merchandising. Merchandising? What's that? Merchandising. Come, I'll show you. Merchandising, merchandising, where the real money's made. Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network for all the t-shirts you see here from the West Coast professor Jeff Meacham himself. You can get shirts for the Jeff Meacham Network, Talk Wrestling, as well as the red and gold Meachamania shirts. And while you're there, don't forget to get your shirts of the Casa D18 Studios Brotherhood, the Dads on Wrestling shirt, the Renegade J.J. Williams, Stat Boy Sports Bar, and the hashtag Stat Boy Approved shirt. Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network and score your shirts today. Now, and while Ron, you know, ratings and that, I don't know where we are as far as giving our stars or whatever, but, you know, I, I, I rate all of these very high. So we'll go ahead and get there when we get there. But well, let's go ahead and segue into that. You know, you know how I handle this. Yes. Do half stars, no quarters. Right. I where would do you say, put the original Frankenstein? I would say based on the month you're presenting and based on the movies that I have seen and the movies I will see that I've seen like maybe once or so before, this one definitely rates very high for me of the ones in this in this universal grand series, and I will definitely very easily give it a five. Okay. And you know, me rating a horror movie five, anything outside of my little my little slasher loves that I have, um, and I certainly won't give any of the, most of those fives either. Let's not kid ourselves um, because they don't hurt ties. I love y'all, but you don't. Um, again, the less is more. The simple approach. The fact that again, it all goes back to ten years ago. I can take my three-year-old to see this. He gets it. I can take my 80-something-year-old grandparents to see it. They get it. We get it. Everybody can relate to this movie on some level. It translates well through time. That's what makes it beautiful. I completely agree. And I, as well, give it five stars out of five. Yesterday's Dracula, I only rated it four and a half. There you go. <clears throat> but dare I say that this is one of the perfect Universal Monster movies. And, you know, it's a morality tale at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. This is what happens if you try to do what was never meant to be done. Yep. You go and play God and you get burned. Yeah. yeah. Quite literally. Yeah. You play God, God plays you right back, brother. And 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 I I will say this as far as you know this being the perfect one. How many to the, if you go back to Universal? Last time I was there was four years ago. Grant, as far as in the park, how many of these Universal classic monsters actually go and still roam the park as meetable characters? I can tell you the exact number. One is always constant. This guy. I can't. I'm on camera. I can't point. This guy. Frankenstein. The monster is always walking around. You sometimes see the bride pop out. You sometimes see maybe Dracula. But every time I've seen pictures of people in the park in modern years, they always have a picture with Frankenstein's monster. Always. Because see, I, don't use, I don't usually see the bride pop out, maybe closer to this time of year, Halloween. Right. But the three that I usually always see pop up are Frank, Drac, and Wolfman. Right. I just Wolfman usually around the tram right. area to True. try to get that little jump scare. Drac and Frank usually roam in the parks. Yeah. It, 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 like I said, when we went, it was the summer. So, you know, you weren't seeing Drac or and matter of fact, the, the jump scare on the tram was more uh Norman Bates there by the by the motel and by the house. So that was well, he's usually there too. Tremendous. The last time I think I went was around April. Okay, well, there and I think I got Drac, and I might have got Frank that same day. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just so tickled that, you know, walking through, for lack of a better term, if you don't remember, you guys don't know the layout, but, you know, over in the Lucy area, you know, Frank and Lucy and Beetlejuice and Doc, thank God Doc Brown popped out. That was amazing. Um, right, Scott. And, and, you know, Spun, you know, within that little area, you had, you know, Frank, Lucy, Doc Brown, and SpongeBob. It's like, I literally am going through a movie studio right now. And I love it. Um, Talk about generations right there. Yep. Frank for the 30s. 
Lucy for the 50s, Doc for the 80s, and SpongeBob for the modern audiences. Yes. You talk about generations. Can you get much more generational than that? And as much as I deplore SpongeBob on basic levels, he Same. relates to multi generations too. Just like Lucy always has, just like Doc Brown always will, just like our subject today always will. There's a reason Frankenstein's monster in an incarnation was the lead character of the monsters. There's a reason that Rob Zombie in today's world is latching onto the monsters and making a movie out of it because of the lead set by Fred Gwynn in the role of Herman, the Frankenstein monster. It's funny that you mentioned the Rob Zombie because Rob Zombie's always been fascinated by the monsters. Yes. yes. His song Dragula is an homage to the monsters vehicle. Oh, very much so. And I, and I absolutely love it. And I, I I love that he's a fan still. I love seeing stuff like that. You know, me when, too. And I'm I'm really curious to see what he's gonna do because you think Rob Zombie, you think his Halloween movies, you think House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects, yes. you know, you think these grotesque bloodbath films anti this the monsters are not no those characters. But I also can't see Rob Zombie doing a straight up slapsticky film. No. Like it's gonna be interesting to see, you know, is this the Munsters with the more, for lack of a better term, Burton-esque twist? I was gonna say. Yep. Instead I, of I, being, you know, full-blown zombie, or is he gonna do something that no one would ever imagine with these characters? Yeah, I will I will say this. It seems like he's staying pretty faithful. When you figure that, you know. One of the first things he posted on social media was a ride in the Munsters car with the Munsters theme playing with Butch Patrick at the, at the at the wheel of the car. That says everything. When the fact that he's posting, you know, 13, 13's live and well the other day and you're seeing the house go up, it's like, oh man, oh man. So I have a feeling that as much as we hoped he would do well with Michael and we were kind of like, yeah, he did okay at the first one, Rob. The second one, eh deviate off the path i really think he's gonna do he loves this these guys so much i don't know if he loved halloween as much as he does the monsters now so you also have to keep in mind this rob is also 15 years older than he was making his halloween movies rob's perspective on a lot of things has changed you got you gotta believe you know rob's had the burden and blessing of hindsight of his halloween movies either getting loved or just torpedoed. So you have to believe that he'll keep it. Granted, he's very much a, I stick to my vision, love me, hate me, I don't give a crap. But, you know, the Munsters, and, and again, this is, you know, coming from Universal Horror fans, the Munsters tend to, you know, keep in people's hearts in a more whimsical way than the Michael Myers series. So I think that if Rob deviates too far off the path, he might get, you know, the proverbial lynch mob after him chasing him into the into the into the watermill instead. So, you know. We'll and, and with that, I think we've brought it back full circle there, talking about perspective and everything. Yes. Before we sign off and I do my goodbyes, Mr. Meachlin, is there anything that you would like to plug or get out there? I know this Friday you have a replay. I do indeed. And I'm very Mummy. much forward to it. Because I have not seen this one the whole way through, and now that I have the the pleasure of owning it as part of my little, I call it my starter kit, just in you know in, in, in tongue in cheek mode. But you that's know, a good way to refer to it. Very much what it is. Uh, matter of fact, I think other than Invisible Man, you're you're doing all these. So it's like okay, I have yeah. a ring. That's awesome. So um, looking forward to showcasing that. Looking forward to the weekend because one way or the other. You know, as as the wrestling god, as opposed to the monster god, would say, "Come the creek, don't rise. Come hell or high water." You and I are going to be out in Enfield, Pasadena. You know, a good chunk of the day, um, checking out different locations, not just Halloween centric. But our our primary mission, if you will, is to go over to the Sugarman Gallery and see the original Michael Myers, the original Linda from the original movie, the very first Michael Myers, little Will Sandon from. 43 years ago now um, and get to see these people and meet these people and take pictures and get signatures from these people. I am Jones and like a mother. I'll tell you what, dude, I'm like, okay, 
needs to be Saturday. Um, so I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to this month with you doing the horror movies, with me getting the material together for the Halloween panel. Um, actually, this is going up what day for refresh my memory? I'm sorry. This is going up tomorrow. Okay. So for uh so if if things work out again, I'm trying to mm -hmm. together. We've been trying to get the the man behind you can't kill the boogeyman on the channel for a hot minute here. If things work out the way they should work out, he will be on one on one Thursday. Um, because I've had a couple of cancellations and a couple of missteps or whatever, but he and I have been trying to get him into the studio to talk about this little fan film that has become a phenomenon in my own mind because I was I was able to be a part of a, a good a good lot of the not the production necessarily but a lot of the conversation and whatnot and I was able to meet the people involved and it's a really great project and I think he's such a fan and I, I didn't realize how big a fan he was going into my characters and I didn't realize how much of a fan I've become of Michael in just a short span and yeah because when you lived with me. 10 years ago. Right. As you said, you were not the biggest scary movie fan. Like you had some knowledge right. of Freddy, of Jason, of Chucky. Chucky was probably the one that you were most into. Most. You had the full set. Yes. You know, you knew of Ghostface, right. but you weren't like balls deep into these films. No. And, you know, 10 years later, here you are, you know, you've met Danielle Harris. You've gotten you know, her to do cameos for your friend. You've yep. had other people, you know, you're you're like so deep into the Michael Myers mythos now. Yes. And I you know the yeah. the Padawan has become a master, so to speak, hasn't quite gotten to his seat at the council. No. But you're rising up there. You're rising well, up the ranks. And and this panel I'm trying to get at the end of the month is very much my attempt to get that seat in a non-Anakin way of having the chance to go, yeah, you do it. Um, so, uh, and if you, if you understand that reference, thank you. God, we love you for that shit. No, no, no why. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's very interesting that my Octobers have very much evolved from let's cover Hell in a Cell to let's cover some horror movies. Yeah. I'm... Yeah, we're we're at the very infancy right now of the yes. Universal Monsters. You know, we did Dracula yesterday, Frankenstein today. If you want to get technical, like I mentioned yesterday, Hunchback of Notre Dame and Phantom, both with Cheney, are technically Universal Monster movies. Right. They just don't usually get lumped into the canon with Frankenstein, Dracula, Bride, Mummy, Creature. Wolfman, Invisible Man, etc. The other Phantom later, right? It's, it's, I mean, but we're very much in the infancy here, and we've still got a long and winding road, as Sir Paul McCartney taught us back in 1969, to wind and weave through here. Tomorrow, right here on the Casa D18 Studios channel, for another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews, we deviate slightly from the Universal Monsters official, but we feature an actor who is heavily prominent in the Monsters archives. Oh, yes. Bela Lugosi in White Zombie. This film is a big deal because it is one of, if not the first full-length feature zombie film as well as being the film in which Rob Zombie decided to jack the name of for his little band all those years ago. I was going to say, it all comes winding back to, you know, you and your channel, especially when you come onto my channel, dude, the stories just keep just doing this shit. Every time throughout the hour, we all come back to where we was. And then just because I have him on the channel one more time, let's make sure you guys know that on Friday... After premiering here in its normal time slot, The Mummy will be replayed at 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern on the Jeff Meacham Network. Yes. As I always say on the videos, and I'll say it since you're here with me right now, thank you very much, Mr. Meacham, for allowing us to invade the time slot generally held by the dads, not always on wrestling. 
those other weeks where we don't have content from that show going up. But Dad's also very Halloween, October Center. We had Hell in a Cell last week. We're going to have Halloween party songs next week. The, the the greatest matches of Edge, who you know started out as a vampire character with the Brood back all those years ago. So mm-hmm. everything ties in, my friends. And you know, we we like to, like we always say with him, we love to weave stories. We love to tell those tales of 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 ye olden days. And you know, for us, that there is ye olden days. So you know, pretty um, much. And you know, but the fact that we're ending the official broadcast schedule with dads on Edge, and then. We go into Halloween weekend, and man, like the 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 proverbial greatest you know Halloween story saga continues next week. I mean, I'm just this month is so cool for me for so many reasons, and I can't wait to go see this movie. I can't wait to see the fan films premiere. I can't wait to get back from this cruise and really get deep into the saga and just close the month out. And as we talked about on recap. Go from a Tom Hanks, you know, you know, go from a horror movie, uh, horror movie presentation to a Tom Hanks horror movie to to Tom Hanks month, and get into November, and get into a completely different, you know, realm of perspective, if you will, because Tom Hanks is a multi person of his damn self. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> Looking forward to it, brother. So, with all that being said, to all my loyal fans and viewers out there that tune in today watching the premiere, leaving those thoughts and comments all the way over there next to Jeff. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate each and every one of you. Likewise, all my loyal fans and viewers are tuning in a little bit later in the day, watching on demand, leaving those thoughts and comments down there underneath the laboratory with Henry Frankenstein. Thank you very much. We appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you to all my fans, you know, that keep tuning in trying to go back in the archives, watching those old episodes of Renegade of Wrestling, Dads on Wrestling, Renegade's Reviews audio show, trying to help boost up my viewership hours so that I can eventually get monetized, make some money off this endeavor. Thank you to all of you that joined us today and tuned in, and we will see you guys next time.